honor to come before you today. And the word that I will be sharing is about saying yes to God. Amen? Hallelujah. So what does that mean, yes? It's a simple word, three letters. We use it all the time. But to use the word yes means that you're acknowledging, you're affirming, you're consenting, or you're in agreement with something. Hallelujah. The book of Matthew, chapter 5, 37 says, but let your yes be yes and your no, no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. In other words, when you say yes to something, you're committing to it. Make sure you keep your word. And when you say no to something, commit to that no. Don't waver. Because here it says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything other than a yes or a no is deceit. It says it. It says it's from the evil one. So sometimes believers think that by saying yes to God is good enough. But God doesn't just want lip service. What God really wants is that you do more than just your words. It's more than just a yes. Yes, saying it is the first step. Amen? But there's more that follows that yes. So the yes should really mean that it's a position of your heart. It's a stance that you take. It's a lifestyle that you live. So I want you to repeat with me and say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I say, yes, Lord. And that yes should be a forever thing. It shouldn't be a wavering thing. Because a lot of times believers say yes, but really mean maybe. They might mean sometimes. It depends. Some Christians walk in a lifestyle that's convenient for them. So their yes is only temporary. Because oftentimes your yes turns into a maybe. Or into a sometimes. Or into when it's right for me. When I feel like pulling that title as a Christian. And when I feel like it's appropriate to use it then I'll say yes. But other times I say no. Because other times I might not want to yield to what God is calling me to do. So if you say yes, that means you have to keep your word. Amen? And FYI, I'm just, I want you to know that saying no can also be a good thing. Sometimes we say yes to everything. And it might not be a good thing. Sometimes we might say yes reluctantly, and really, we don't want to say yes. You can use that two-letter word, no. Amen? But we're not going to say no to the Lord. <laughs> That's just a little bonus in case you didn't know. You can use the word no. Amen? All right. Verse 22 says, so Noah did everything exactly as God had commanded him. That verse right there is when Noah said yes. He said yes to the Lord. Amen? And how many of you know exactly what happened at the end of that story? We know that the, flood, the earth, whole earth was flooded. Even before it came to the flooding, Noah was mocked. People didn't believe him. But he got clear instructions from the Lord about what was going to happen. So he has zero doubt. So as he's working along on the ark and saying, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, with every time he hammered a nail into the, into the boat, he said, yes, Lord, each time. As the people taunted him and made fun of him and said, you're just crazy building this big old boat for what? And he's like, yes, Lord. God gave him instructions and he did not waver. He knew what was going to come and he was preparing for what was going to come. But because he built the ark, because Noah said yes to the Lord, not only 
was he saved, his wife, his three sons, his daughters-in-laws, and all the animals that he put on the earth, guess what? He preserved future generations. Hallelujah. And that's why I say your yes is bigger. It's bigger than what you think it is. Amen? Look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me. And I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abused them. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people, Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses protested to God, who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? So let me just highlight something here. Here we see that he's contending and protesting with God. We have Noah who hears clear instructions on, on, from God, and he's like, let, let, let me go find that wood, let me go find that tar, the hammer, and the nails. And here's Moses doing the opposite. He's protesting against God. Wouldn't you think if God really was speaking to you in an audible voice, in that fashion, do you think that you would protest? I would be petrified. I'm just saying. <laughs> But think about it, right? Here's a burning bush that isn't being consumed. And from that bush is a voice calling your name, Natalie, Natalie. And you're like, what is going on? <laughs> and then I give you instructions and you say, mm -mm, I'm not going over there. But why? Why did Moses deny God's request at first? He felt like he was disqualified. So Moses gives all kinds of excuses that we know of, right? So one is, it clearly says it here, I'm not good enough. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Who am I? His second excuse, I don't have all the answers. When we take a step of faith, we don't have all the answers. Excuse number three, people won't believe me. Number four, I'm terrible at public speaking. Number five, I'm just not qualified. Can any of you identify with any of this that I just mentioned? If it's one thing I learned in college is that people do not like public speaking. Every time we had a, you know, stand in front of the class and do a presentation, I was always the first one to be like, can I go first? Because I didn't want to wait in anticipation. I don't mind speaking in front of people. Sometimes nerves get to me a little bit. But I was always like, I want to go first so I don't have to wait and wait and wait and build up anxiety. No, just let me go first. <laughs> so people oftentimes they have anxiety with public speaking, right? So I think that with these excuses here, we can all identify at some point. But know this, you are qualified. Amen? You are qualified. Glory. So despite how he felt, God didn't feel that way towards him. Even though he felt he was disqualified, even though he felt he couldn't speak in public. God saw beyond that. The problem was Moses wasn't seeing himself the way that God was seeing him. And we need to see ourselves the way that God is seeing us. Amen? So he called himself disqualified. God says you're qualified. If God says you're qualified, then guess what? Then you're qualified, right? Glory. Exodus 4, verse 18 says, So Moses went back home to Jethro, his father-in-law, and he said this, Please let me return to my relatives in Egypt. I don't even know if they're still alive. And Jethro says, Go in peace. Verse 20 says, So Moses took his wife and his sons and put them on a donkey and headed back to the land of Egypt, in his hand, he carried the staff of God. So now we see 
that Moses finally said, yes, Lord. He packed up his wife and kids and he took his rod. He took his staff because now he understood what part of the vision was. Even though he may not have understood it completely, but he understood that he said yes to what God was calling him to do. Amen? And when you say yes to what God is calling you to do, you're going to be obedient. You're going to take a step of faith. And even though you don't have all the answers, God has the answers already. You just have to take a step of faith. Amen? Glory. Just think about if Moses had said no. Think about it for a quick second. What would have become of Moses in that whole situation if he had said no? <laughs> he would have still been tending sheep. <laughs> there would be no Joshua generation. The children of Israel would probably still have remained captive. They would never have experienced the promised land. The future of the generations, the future generations depended on Moses' yes. So here we see again preservation. Preservation to a lineage. Hallelujah. God is so good that when we say yes, it preserves our future lineage. <laughs> Glory. Think about it really, like, just think about it for a second. We have children. Most of us have children here, as I'm looking around the room. And we love our kids. But do you often think about your future generations? All right, I'm going to leave you with that for a second. But God had his hand over Esther. He anointed her. She fasted and prayed before she came into the king's presence. And she got the favor. And her people were saved. And once again, we see preservation. Say preservation. She preserved her future lineage. These are not just small stories. We got to look at the bigger picture here. Her yes saved her lineage. Her yes saved future generations. Amen? So when I tell you that your yes to the Lord needs to be yes to the Lord, your yes to the Lord is bigger than you just saying, yeah, I'm going to serve God. It's bigger than that. The bigger picture is what are you going to sow into your future? What are you going to sow, sow into your future generations? What are you going to sow into your children? What are you going to sow into your grandchildren? What are you going to sow into your nieces and nephews? What are you going to sow into your family who doesn't know Christ? Your yes goes bigger than you. Your yes transcends to future generations. So I'm sorry to tell you, but it ain't about you. Turn to your neighbor and say, it ain't about you. I'm sorry, let me say it properly. It's not about you. Okay? So our yes to the Lord is depending on a lot more than just me walking out my own salvation. It's more than me knowing scripture. It's more than me just going to church. It's more than me just, you know, saying, oh, I've, I'm in the presence of the Lord. Why? Why? Why are you doing these things? Amen? Why are you doing these things? The bigger picture is about the setup. The bigger picture is about your future. The bigger picture is about saving your future generations. It's about your bloodline. It's about your lineage. Amen? Hallelujah. So that's why I had you repeat a couple of times to say yes to the Lord and understand that it's bigger than just me saying a three-letter word. It's not about just, yes, Lord. It's about, yes, Lord, Seth and Sienna. Yes, Lord, their children. Yes, Lord, my parents. Yes, Lord, my siblings. Yes, Lord. Am I the only one with family here? And then on top of that, it's about impacting, making an impact on people around us so that we can spread the gospel. So that we can advance the kingdom of God. Because in case you didn't know, the devil's a liar. 
and a lot of people believe it. A lot of people believe the lies. A lot of people fall into those tricks. But our yes is going to transcend. Hallelujah. I see our yes. I see the yes that me and my husband made. Because when you say yes, it's more, again, it's more than a three-letter word. When you say yes, it's about, I have to make sacrifices. And that's the problem with a lot of people. That's the problem with a lot of men and women who say they're Christians, but are wobbly in their faith. They got one foot in the world, one foot in the word, because they haven't fully committed. And why haven't they fully committed? They're not saying the yes, but they're also not paying a price. You see, because saying yes to God means saying no to the flesh. Saying yes to God means saying no to all the things we did in the world. But when you say yes, you're saying, Lord, I'm saying yes to you, but this hurts. I'm saying yes to you, but I got to pay a price. I'm saying yes to you, but I don't have all the answers. I'm saying yes to you, but I'm not really sure what I'm going to do. I'm saying yes to you, but what does it feel like to take a step of faith? I'm saying yes, and I don't know where I'm going. You told me to come to Tampa, but I don't know anybody. You told me to come to Tampa, and I don't have any friends. I don't have any family. You told me we were to go to Tampa so that we could start a church. And how do we do that? When do we do that? Where's our people? We don't have them. So every step of faith, every step of faith, yeah, you're not going to have all the answers when you step out in faith. When you step out in faith, you step out blind. It's like don't count on your vision because your vision, let me tell you, sometimes we see things and your vision is off. That's why we got glasses. I got my contacts on right now. Without my contacts, I can't see straight. All right? Hallelujah. Glory, Jesus. So when you take a step of faith, yes, there's going to be a lot of times where you feel like you're blind. You don't know what to do next, but that's okay. Because he's going to be the lamp unto your path. He's going to light up where to go. Don't do things prematurely. Wait on the Lord. When you wait on the Lord, he's going to do great things. You know, I know that you guys probably, some of you probably know the story about how we're even here in a Korean temple. <laughs> Puerto Rican, Dominican, end up in Tampa, no friends, no family, and a Korean seven-day Adventist church. Does it make sense, right? But whatever didn't fit in our car didn't make it. So it was a fresh start. It really was blind. When I tell you we knew nothing, we knew no one, and we took a step of faith, it didn't make sense. But we knew how to hear the voice of God. And why did we know how to hear the voice of God? Because we said yes. And we didn't say yes once. We said yes over and over and over and over and over again. We paid a price over and over and over again. And so when you say yes, you have to understand, again, it's not just lip service. It's a stance. It's a lifestyle. It's the position of your heart, as I said in the beginning. It's a position of your heart. And so I want to ask, are you going to say yes to preserve your future generations? Are you going to say yes and put your flesh aside? Are you going to say yes and say, truly, I'm willing to pay the price. I might not always be comfortable. I might not always like the things that I'm required to do. But I'm going to tell you that <laughs> our yes has gone a long way. It's been many, many years. And maybe you're not called to be a pastor because that's not everybody's lot in life. And that's okay. But what are you doing for the kingdom of God? What are you doing to preserve your future bloodline? Thank you, Lord. What would have been if we didn't say yes to the Lord? 
if we didn't say yes to the Lord, I wouldn't even be looking at your faces right now. So my yes was bigger than me. My yes was about a future generation. My yes was about helping to preserve your future bloodline, to preserve your future generations. Because here we equip. Here, you learn how to grow, you learn in the word. This is no garbage. We don't change the word according to our lifestyle. We don't accommodate people's lifestyles. We're gonna tell you straight up whether you like it or not. I'm sorry, but we're always gonna tell you the truth. And the truth hurts. And how many can say, the truth hurts? But you know, there's a verse in the Bible that says, whom the, the Lord loves, he chastises. And so when he chastises us, it's not because he's mad with us and doesn't want us to succeed. He chastises us because he loves us. And when we correct, and when we correct our children, we correct them because we love them. You know, there's an old saying, it's better to cry with your children when they're young than for your children when they're older. Because while you have them, while you have them in your care, they're your responsibility. They're your responsibility so you can lead them the right way, Amen. not the crooked way, the straight way. Amen? So our yes is the actions we take, the decisions we make. Our yes is a bold move, something that looks outside of our comfort zone. Something that doesn't fit the square box is bold. It's bigger than what anybody could think about. Our yes, our yes is taking risks. You know, I, I studied business in college and one of the foundational things that I learned is the bigger the risk, the bigger the reward. So, you know, when you're young, you do risky things. <laughs> Young people do risky things. And let's say in the financial realm, if anyone has a 401k, if anyone is in their 20s, they always advise them, you know, go all out with your 401k and your investments. Take the bigger risks because you're young. But as you get older, it's like, I ain't taking that kind of risk with my money because I'm trying to have something for the future, right? And so... But there's times where people think outside the box and they take a big risk and then you see a big reward. So this here, fire at the altar, is our risk. It's the risk that we said yes to the Lord. It's the risk that we decided we were going to be obedient because in saying yes, you have to be obedient. And in our obedience, we are where we are today. And I know to you it's probably just a story, but for me, this has been amazing. I mean, we're in Tampa now. I still thank God for palm trees and nice weather and everything. But we're in Tampa now 12 years. I'll be 13 years this August. And to think how far we've come because of a yes. Because of a yes. Glory. And we all know what the ultimate yes was. It was Jesus going to the cross. And if he had said no, because he could have, because he had free will, but if he had said no, we'd be in a different ball game too. So thank you, Jesus, for saying the ultimate yes. <laughs> Hallelujah. So there's a cost to saying yes. These examples of Esther and Moses and Noah and ourselves and Jesus had an expense that came along with that yes. So I'm just going to ask everyone to stand. And just make this declaration with me. So declare this with me. I want to protect. protect. Come on, say it like you believe it. I want to protect, protect my future genealogy, my future genealogy. And, the and the generations that follow. So they can also say yes, also say yes. to the call of God, call of God. over their life. Over their life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory, Jesus.